in our previous lectures we have understood about the union executives and that is the topic that we have been dealing with and the union executives comprise of the president the vice president the prime minister the council of ministers and the attorney general of india so we already covered the president and then you also covered the vice president today we will cover the prime minister the council of ministers and also the cabinet system in our country now before i proceed with this particular topic although the president is considered to be the head of the union executive the president is not the real executive because of the parliamentary system that we have in our country and it is a prime minister who is a real executive so in this class we'll try to understand basically as to what is the kind of parliamentary system that we have and under the constitution of india you know that the president has to act in accordance with the aid and advice of the council of ministers and then you'll also understand as to how our country functions especially with regard to what is called as the cabinet system although we talk of the president to act in accordance with the aid and advice of the council of ministers it is actually the cabinet which is very powerful in our country so mostly all the decisions of the government is taken by the cabinet and the decisions are influenced by different cabinet committees in our country so let us try to understand as to what these cabinet committees are and also in general what is the position of prime minister in our country and what is his role with regard to the very in relation to various other dignitaries so let us try to proceed further we'll try to understand that so this would be our lecture number 83 and this is babu gnashekaran faculty for indian polity and governance I secured all India Rank 337 in Civil Service Examination 2016. All right, we'll move forward and we'll try to understand the position of the Prime Minister. But before that, let us try to understand as to what is a parliamentary system. So this is something that I already explained. What is a parliamentary system? A parliamentary system is something where the government is formed from the legislature. And in India, if you see where the government is formed, the government is formed at the union level from the Lok Sabha. and this government has to be formed from the lok sabha and this government is continuously accountable to the legislature that is to the lok sabha because under the parliamentary system any government that is formed that government needs a continuous accountability they have to continuously have the majority in the lok sabha and at any time if the majority is lost then that government can be dismissed and so the essence of parliamentary democracy is that the legitimacy of any government comes from its ability to maintain the majority so the government is formed from the legislature and the government is formed by a party that is there in power and the government is accountable to the legislature so in a parliamentary democracy ultimately who is the real power it is the prime minister and the council of ministers because they are the one who are elected by the people although not directly they are elected as representatives to the parliament and then subsequently they form the government so the president under the constitutional system is just a nominal executive and he is not a real executive so we'll try to understand all those things as we will proceed further and if you look into the constitution you'll also understand that the prime minister under the constitution of india is appointed by the president in fact article 75 of the constitution categorically says that the prime minister shall be appointed by the president but however the question is is there any constitutional direction as to who shall be appointed as the prime minister of india nothing is explicitly given in the constitution so what we follow is only a constitutional convention so there's a constitutional convention that we follow or a conventional practice that we follow over a period of time and what is this conventional practice the conventional practice is that usually a leader of the majority party is appointed as the prime minister if no party is having the majority then the leader of the largest coalition is appointed as the prime minister so this is the convention that has been followed over a period of time so the question is is there any constitutional discretion to the president in appointing the prime minister can the president of india can exercise his discretion so normally he follows the constitutional convention but yes under certain circumstances he can exercise what is called as the constitutional discretion so what are the circumstances under which he can exercise the constitutional discretion the circumstances under which he can exercise his discretion is that let us assume that the election to the lok sabha is completed but after the elections no party is having the majority let us assume that there is a hung parliament 
So, what is a hung parliament? So, hung parliament is a situation that no party is having a majority or a single coalition of party is having a majority. So, that is an instance that no party is having a majority. So, under such a circumstances, the president can exercise his discretion. So, this is one discretion where they can exercise the discretion. One, two, that the Lok Sabha is dissolved, not the Lok Sabha is dissolved, but let us assume the government has lost majority. Some government has lost majority and there is no alternative party that is having the majority. Lost majority and hence the government is dismissed and then there is no alternative party that is having the majority. If there is any alternative party which is having the majority or alternative party is not able to form the government, then the leader of that particular party can be appointed as the prime minister. But let us assume that there is no alternative party which is capable of forming the government. Three. Under the circumstances, when the Prime Minister suddenly dies, Prime Minister suddenly dies. So, during his term, he suddenly died and there is no alternative successor. Nobody is elected as the leader of that particular party. Now, under such circumstances, the President can exercise certain element of discretion. Because it is important that you have to understand that the party or the leader does not have to prove the majority before the government is formed. Normally, the government can be formed and after the government is formed, then the Prime Minister can prove the majority. Usually, again, there is no constitutional time limit within which he has to prove the majority. But normally, one month time maximum may be given by the President to the Prime Minister or whoever is appointed as a Prime Minister to prove their majority. So, what is the basic understanding that you should have? So, generally, please understand, normally understand. So, normally, that you will have to understand that the President will follow this convention. Usually, the leader of the majority party or the leader of the party which is having the majority should be appointed as the Prime Minister. When somebody is having the majority, then they should be appointed. But in case if it is not there, under these circumstances, yes, he can exercise certain constitutional discretion. So, in the history of India, in the political history of India, we have few examples as well. Say, for example, President Neelam Sanjeev Reddy. So, when he was the President, and there existed a circumstances that the government was dismissed. Although the Lok Sabha had its term, but the government was dismissed. The government which was led by the Moraji Desai, the Moraji Desai government, which is basically from the Janata Party, was dismissed in 1979. And then there was no obvious successor and there, there was no alternative party to form the government. So, under such a circumstances, the then President of India has appointed Mr. Charan Singh as the chief, Charan Singh as the Prime Minister. And then subsequently he was asked to prove the majority. So, this is one instance where he exercises discretion. And similarly, another incident uh, that President Zail Singh has appointed Mr. Gandhi as the uh, Prime Minister of India, Mr. Gandhi as the Prime Minister. So, in this case, Mr. Raju Gandhi was appointed as the Prime Minister of India in 1984. So, this is the circumstances when Indira Gandhi suddenly died. When Indira Gandhi was the Prime Minister of India, she was assassinated, you know that, and she suddenly died. And because of this particular reason, that there was no obvious successor in the party, nobody was chosen as the leader of the party. And in the absence of the leader of the party, Mr. Raju Gandhi was appointed as the Prime Minister. So, the President has exercised his discretion. But later, the Congress party has chosen him as the, prime, as the leader of the party. That is a different thing. But when he was appointed, he was not the leader of the party. So, these are the circumstances under which the president can exercise his discretionary powers. And then in both the cases, I think that the president has given almost a month time to prove their majority in the house. So, this is how the president can exercise his discretion with regard to appointment of the prime minister. But otherwise, he has to follow the constitutional convention that I have said. And further, the Supreme Court of India has categorically said that the prime minister there is no requirement under the constitution for the prime minister to be a member of either house of the parliament. Is it mandatory for the prime minister to be either houses of the parliament? Not required. Even a person who is not member of either houses of the parliament can be appointed as the prime minister. But all that he has to make sure is that he has to get elected to the house within a period of, see, he has to become a member of the house, not basically elected. He can be a member of the Lok Sabha or Rajya Sabha. He can be a nominated member also in the Rajya Sabha, but he has to become a member of parliament within a period of six months. If you look into the constitutional history, in 1966, Indira Gandhi was appointed as the Prime Minister. She was a member of Rajya Sabha. In 1996, again this has happened when Mr. Deva Gowda was appointed as the Prime Minister. He was a member of Rajya Sabha. Again it happened in 2004 when Mr. Manmohan Singh was appointed as the Prime Minister. 
he was a member of the Rajya Sabha. So, there were instances that uh, a person even from the Rajya Sabha can be appointed as a Prime Minister and in fact, even if they are not a member of both houses of the Parliament, still they can be appointed. And if you look into the difference between the constitutional system in India and that of UK, although we have borrowed our parliamentary system from United Kingdom, there is some element of difference between these two constitutions. In UK, if you see in United Kingdom, in United Kingdom, the Prime Minister has to be from their lower house. He does not allowed, but in India, he can be a member of either houses of the parliament. So, this is the basic idea that you should have with regard to the position of Prime Minister in our country. So, let us proceed further. Let us try to understand the powers and functions of the Prime Minister. But before we proceed further, Study IQ has launched its prelims to interview batch for the month of August. And students who are focusing for 2024 examination, they can opt for this particular course. As the name suggests, prelims to interview course, it has number of features. For all the features, you can just download the brochure and you can have a look into the features of the course. But one important feature is that the mains residential program, which provides free boarding and lodging to the students if they clear the prelims examination in 2024. An exclusive training will be given for their mains examination. So, the batches are in all the languages, English, English and also in the Hindi languages and all the batches will be, this time it will be all morning batches. And if you want an additional discount on any of these courses, you may have to use my code Babulai. Alright. So, we will just move on to the continuation of the Prime Minister. So, you can understand that anybody who is appointed as the Prime Minister of India, he or she needs to be administered an oath. And who has to administer this oath? The pre President of India has to administer this oath. And he holds office during the pleasure of President. This is very, very important. So, what does it mean by the word pleasure of the President? Does it mean that someone who is appointed as a Prime Minister can be removed at any point of time? Now, someone who is appointed as a Prime Minister cannot be removed at any point of time. So, he cannot be removed at any point of time. So, this is very, very important. So, can they be removed at any point of time? Although it says that they hold office during the pleasure of the president, they cannot be removed at any point of time. You will have to understand that, that as long as they have the majority in the house, as long as the prime minister enjoys a majority in the Lok Sabha, so as long as this majority is exercised and enjoyed by the prime minister, then he or she cannot be removed from the government. So, that is the understanding you should have. So, when does the pleasure of the president comes into picture? Although the constitution says that the pleasure of the president, if a question comes in the examination that the prime minister holds office during the pleasure of the president, so that particular statement is right. There is nothing wrong in that. But however, what is the meaning that is implied under that particular statement? That is the pleasure of the president. The meaning that is implied under this particular statement is that the prime minister holds office during the pleasure of the president means as long as the prime minister is enjoying the majority in the house the president can do nothing about it. The president cannot dismiss the prime minister arbitrarily. But as the moment the prime minister has lost the majority in the Lok Sabha, then the discretion of the president comes in, then the president can dismiss the prime minister and the council of ministers and then subsequently he can dissolve the Lok Sabha also if no other party is able to form an alternative government. So, this is the understanding that you should have. And as we will move forward, let us also try to understand the powers and the functions of the Prime Minister. Under the Constitution of India, although the President is the head of the Union Executive, the President is only a nominal executive or you can say he is an executive only for the namesake. And who is the real executive under the Constitution? The real executive is the Prime Minister headed, the Prime Minister who is heading the Council of Ministers. So, being the real executive or he is also called as the de jure head. So, who is the real executive or who is the one who is controlling and who is calling all the shots is the Prime Minister and who is also heading the Council of Ministers. So, what is the function that the Prime Minister plays or what are the functions of the Prime Minister? So, the Prime Minister has certain functions with majorly with regard to or in relation to these bodies. So, first in relation to the Council of Ministers. So, what are the functions of the Prime Minister in relation to the Council of Ministers? So, first and foremost, you will have to understand that the Council of Ministers are appointed by the President, but on the advice of the Prime Minister. So, who will advise to appoint the Council of Ministers? It is the 
prime minister will advise the president to appoint the council of ministers. In fact, the president can appoint the council of ministers, but the president cannot appoint on his own. It is the prime minister who will advise the president to appoint the other council of ministers. That means basically you will have to understand the prime minister has the power or the prime minister is the one who has to basically decide his colleagues so that he can work effectively. So, two. So, apart from the appointment of the council of ministers on the advice of the prime minister. So, what does the prime minister also do? The prime minister coordinates between the various ministries. So, in fact, even before the coordination, it is the one who will allocate the portfolio. It is the one who will allocate the portfolio. When I say portfolio, so he is the one, the prime minister is the one who will determine as to what portfolio has to, portfolio has to be assigned to which minister. So, who will head the home ministry? Who will take charge of the defense ministry? Who will take charge of the finance ministry? So, for example, finance ministry is now headed by Nirmala Sita Raman, defense ministry by another cabinet minister. Raj, Mr. Rajnath Singh and then you have the Home Ministry which is headed by Amit Shah. So, who will decide all those things? So, it will all be decided by the Prime Minister of India. Mr. Narendra Modi is the one who will decide all those things. So, it is basically who will decide and who will allocate the portfolio. Okay, once the portfolio is allocated, if there is any problem between two different ministries, so who will head all these or who will coordinate between various ministries? It is the Prime Minister. Suppose, let us assume that there is a conflict of interest between, let us assume, the, the, the environmental ministry and let us assume the, let us assume environmental ministry and let us assume the uh, ministry for heavy industries or let us assume the ministry for road and transport because they wanted to in develop an infrastructure but the environmental ministry is not giving the clearances. Now, who is going to coordinate under all such circumstances? Such coordination will be done by the Prime Minister. So, in relation to the Council of Ministers, he plays a very, very important role. And then it is not only in relation to the Council of Ministers, he also plays an important role with regard to the President of India. So, what is his role with regard to the President of India? So, in fact, under Article 75 of the Constitution, please understand, under Article 75 of the Constitution, he is appointed by, the Prime Minister is appointed by the President. So, first of all, you have to understand, it is the president who will appoint the prime minister and we have already seen whom he will appoint as the prime minister to. Under article 78 of the constitution, this is very important, under article 78 of the constitution, the prime minister can place the proposals with regard to legislation and the proposals with regard to various administrative matters in front of the president for the consideration of the president. So, this is that the prime minister can do this voluntarily under article 78. Suppose any new proposals for legislation is there, now some new policies are placed, uh, brought in by the government. So, the Prime Minister can apprise the President on all these developments under Article 78. Alternatively, the President can also call upon to submit those things for the consideration of the President. Although President is not a real executive, but he should be aware of what is happening in the government and that the President is very much entitled to know under Article 78 of the Constitution. Apart from that, Various appointments which is done by the government. So, for example, appointment of the CAG, the appointment of the Election Commission of India, which have now recently changed, but otherwise appointment to various higher positions in the government, appointment to the Finance Commission, appointment to various commissions like the National Commission for Scheduled Caste, Scheduled Tribe. Now, all these things are done by the President, but majorly done on the advice of the Prime Minister. Okay, So, this is again an important function that is performed by the President of India, but on the advice of the Prime Minister. And then the Prime Minister also has functions in relation to what? In relation to the Parliament. So, what are the other functions that he performs in relation to the Parliament? Under Article 85 of the Constitution, please understand, under Article 85 of the Constitution, the President has a power to summon, prorogue and dissolve the House. We have already seen as to what is summon. Summon means calling upon the members to start the session. So, summoning of the session and then you have the prorogation that means you can terminate the session. So, summoning, prorogation and the dissolution of the house. Now, all these things are to be done by the president, but all these things are done by the president on the advice of the prime minister majorly. And you see with regard to the parliament, it is the prime minister who will decide the, these, the not only the sessions, it is the prime minister who will decide the agenda of the government in the parliament. 
So he is the one who will set the agenda of the government. So what are the bills that need to be introduced? What are the discussions that the government wanted to have? So who is going to set the agenda of the government in the parliament? It is the prime minister. In fact, there is a separate ministry which is called as Ministry of Parliamentary Affairs and there is a minister who is in charge for this. But however, the ministers will apprise the prime minister continuously and will be in touch with the prime minister in deciding all these things. So, the prime minister has an influential role to decide this as well. It is the prime minister who will announce the policies of the government in the floor of the house. So, whatever is the major policies of the government, who, so who will mostly announce these policies in the floor of the house? It is the prime minister. And in fact, the prime minister himself is the leader of the house. In whichever house he is a, is a member and he is the leader of that particular house. Okay. So, you will have to understand that these are the functions that is performed by the prime minister in relation to what is called as the parliament. In addition to that, the prime minister can also perform certain other functions. Say, for example, he is a chairman of Niti Aayog. You know what is Niti Aayog? So, Niti Aayog is a body which has replaced the S12 Planning Commission of India. So, today it is an important body that give advice as to how the planning can be made by the government of India. So, he is a chairman of Niti Aayog. In addition to that, he is a crisis in manager of the government. He is a crisis in manager. So, in case of any kind of crisis or emergency of the government, so who is going to determine all those things? He is, it is a prime minister. In fact, the prime minister plays an important role in determining the foreign policy of India, foreign policy of India. And if any of the departments is not allocated to any of the ministries or any of the departments is not coming under the domain of any of the ministers, then who will take charge of all those things? It is a prime minister who will keep all those ministries and portfolios to himself. In fact, some of the important portfolios and ministries may be placed under the prime minister himself. So, for example, Department of Atomic Energy, Department of Nuclear Space. So, these are the important departments, Department of Personal and Training. So, the prime minister keeps it for himself. So, he also holds certain portfolio under him. So, these are all the important functions that is performed by the Prime Minister. So, you can understand that his functions are majorly related to all these bodies. That is in relation to Council of Ministers, in relation to President, in relation to Parliament and in relation to the other functionaries. Alright, so now we will just move forward and let us also try to understand the concept of the caretaker government. So, earlier we are trying to understand that whenever the Lok Sabha is dissolved. The Lok Sabha may be dissolved for a number of reasons. So, what are the circumstances on which the Lok Sabha can be dissolved? So, you will understand this. The Lok Sabha can be dissolved for a number of reasons. So, one, it may be because of the fact that the term is over. It is because of the fact that the term is over. The term of the government is over. Or it may also be because of the fact that the government is dismissed. The government is dismissed and there is no alternative party which is able to form the government. For all these reasons, the Lok Sabha may be dissolved and when the Lok Sabha is dissolved and the president has a power to dismiss or dissolve the Lok Sabha under such a circumstances, when the Lok Sabha is dissolved, that means then there has to be elections. The Election Commission of India has to go for elections, but it is not that the Lok Sabha will be dissolved today and immediately there will be elections. It is going to take some time and the Election Commission of India minimum requests two to three months of time to issue the notification and to complete the entire election process. So, obviously, it is going to take some time. So, my question is what will happen to the government at that point of time? Which means once the term is over or once the government is dismissed. So, does it mean that there is no government in India? There will not be any prime minister and the council of ministers. Is it the president who will directly take up the administration in our country? That is not possible under the constitution because the constitution says there shall always be a council of ministers to aid and advise the president. So, this is very, very important that you have to have this understanding that even when the government is dismissed, now 2024, the elections are going to come. So, this is the understanding you should have. So, before 2024, before the elections are about to come, first the Lok Sabha will be dissolved by the president. Once the Lok Sabha is dissolved, then there will be two, three months of time at least before the Election Commission of India conducts election and then the Lok Sabha members are elected and then the new government can be formed. So, what will happen during this interim time that is from the dissolution of Lok Sabha and between the new members to the, the 18th Lok Sabha probably will get elected because now we are the, having the 17th Lok Sabha. So, what will happen to this interim time? Will Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his Council of Ministers continue to exist or they will not exist? That is the question. So, you should not have any confusion with that. 
Mr. Narendra Modi and his ministers would continue to be the Prime Minister and the Council of Ministers respectively even after the Lok Sabha is dissolved. But however, in which capacity they will be ministers? They will be ministers in the capacity of a caretaker government. So, what exactly is this caretaker government? A caretaker government as per the various constitutional, various Supreme Court judgments, what is a caretaker government? A caretaker government is something which will look into the day-to-day -day administration day-to-day -day administration but nothing more than that so that is basically what is called as a caretaker government so a caretaker government is something which will take care of the day-to-day -day administration nothing more than that so what is day-to-day -day administration so whatever is the day-to-day -day activities of the government that they can take carry forward but they cannot come out with any major policy decisions they cannot come out with new bills they cannot come out with new schemes to the people because at this time, if they come out with all those things, then it can have an impact on the electoral outcome because elections are already happening. Whatever is a routine matter which the government normally carries out. So, in those matters, you can advise a president, but you cannot advise a president on the important bills or the important policies of the government. And in this circumstances, if any advice is given, apart from the day-to-day -day administration, the president has the right to reject all those advice. And it would be constitutional for the president to do that because this government has to function only as a caretaker government. So, the word caretaker government is nowhere mentioned, but in order to avoid any interregnum and in order to make sure that there is a prime minister and the council of ministers to advise the president. So, this caretaker government has been provided and it is followed as a convention in our country. So, this is what is exactly called as the caretaker government. Okay. So, this caretaker government is not a very powerful government, but yes, of course, they can carry out the day-to-day -day administration. Alright, so we will move to the next part of our discussion that is the Union Council of Ministers. So, the Prime Minister is the one who is heading this Union Council of Ministers and it is basically the President who will appoint this Union Council of Ministers as well, but not on his own, but on the aid and advice of the Prime Minister. So, the Prime Minister plays a very pivotal role in deciding as to who will be appointed as the ministers, the council of ministers at the union level. And in fact, if you look into the constitution, the constitution article 74 and article 75 are very crucial in understanding as to what is the important function of this council of ministers. You can understand under article 74, which says that the president has to act in accordance with whom? In accordance with the advice which is given by the council of ministers. So, there is a need for Council of Ministers so that they can advise the President and according to that advice, the President can act. And then Article 75 is again very important. Article 75 gives a power to the President to make the appointment, but on the advice of the Prime Minister. So, Article 74 talks about the functions of the Council of Ministers to advise the President and how these Council of Ministers may be appointed. So, these Council of Ministers may be appointed on the advice of the Prime Minister under Article 75 of the Constitution. And further, if you look into the Constitution, although this is not there in the original Constitution, in the original Constitution, there was no restriction as to how many ministers can be there in the Council of Ministers. But however, the Constitution was amended by the 91st Constitutional Amendment Act. So, which Constitutional Amendment Act? This may be asked in the prelims examination. By the 91st Constitutional Amendment Act in 2003. Please understand. By the 91st Constitutional Amendment Act in 2003, the Constitution was amended and a cap was put in in the Constitution. And they fixed the number of ministers to what? They fixed the number of ministers to be not more than 15% of the total strength of the Lok Sabha. So, whatever is the 15% of the total strength of Lok Sabha, only that many number of ministers can be there. The ministers cannot be more than the 15% of the total membership of Lok Sabha. So, this is the basic understanding that you should have. And he or she holds office during the pleasure of the president. That means the ministers hold office during the pleasure of the president as per Article 75 of the Constitution. So, understanding Article 75 is very, very important because it says that the Council of Ministers are appointed by the President, but on the advice of Prime Minister. And how many ministers may be appointed? The number of ministers may not be appointed, more than 15% of the total membership of the Lok Sabha. So, this is in line with the idea of what is called as minimum government and maximum governance. Do not increase the size of 
the number of ministers because too many is the size of the ministers, then the governance cannot be very effective. Okay. So, this is in line with minimum government and maximum governance and it was inserted by the 91st Constitutional Amendment Act in 2003 and the constitution also makes it very clear the ministers holds office during the pressure of the president. Does it mean that the ministers can be removed at any point of time? The ministers cannot be arbitrarily removed. So, the pressure of the president will have the same meaning as to what I have explained. So, here the pressure of the president means that they continue to hold the office, please understand, as long as they have the majority in the Lok Sabha. As long as they have the majority in the Lok Sabha, the pleasure of the president cannot come into existence. The pleasure of the president can come into existence only when they lose the majority in the house. When the council of ministers lose the majority in the house, then the president can dismiss them at any point of time. So, otherwise, if a question comes that they hold office during the pleasure of the president, the statement is true. But what is the meaning that you should understand? that this pressure can be exercised by the president only when they lose the majority. And now the question is, what about the advice which is given by the Council of Ministers? Okay, the constitution says that the president to act in accordance with the aid and advice of the Council of Ministers. But is that advice which is given by the Council of Ministers, is it binding upon the president? In fact, there was no clarity in the original constitution as to whether it is binding upon the president. So, subsequently, there were issues in certain instances where the president in certain instances has not complied with the directions or the advice which is given by the Council of Ministers. And subsequently, this matter has gone to the court. And one of the instances that it has gone to the court is the Samsher Singh case in 1974. In Samsher Singh case in 1974, the question that was brought in front of the judiciary is that what about the advice that is given to the uh, president by the Council of Ministers, is such advice binding upon the president? And nothing is there in the constitution which says that it is binding upon the president and a court has made it very clear. See, the kind of parliamentary system that you are following today is based on the British parliamentary system. It is based on the conventions that is followed in the British parliamentary system. And if you see the model that is followed in the British parliamentary system, there the advice which is given by the ministers is binding upon their monarch. It is binding upon their king or the queen. The king or the queen is just a nominal executive and we have been following almost a similar model of parliamentary system. Instead of a monarch, we have an elected president because our constitution allows a republic. Our constitution is a republic model. And hence, there is an elected president. But however, the president is not the real executive and he does not have much discretionary powers. So, the president is supposed to act in accordance with the aid and advice of the council of ministers. So, Samsher Singh's case made it very clear that the aid and advice which is given by the Council of Ministers is binding upon the president. On top of that, you see that even before that, there was a case which is called as UN or Rao case. So, in this case also, the Supreme Court made it very clear there cannot be any interregnum. That means there cannot be a possibility that the president will act on his own without the Council of Ministers. And that is why the UN or Rao case has made it very clear that even when the Lok Sabha is dissolved, even when the government is dismissed, the Prime Minister and the Council of Ministers would continue to be a caretaker government. They would continue to be a caretaker government and this caretaker government will advise the President as to how to carry out the functions on a day-to-day -day basis. So, it is very clear from the various judgments of the Supreme Court that the President is never to act on his discretion or the President to act in accordance with the aid and advice of the Council of Ministers. And this is what has been clarified by the court. So, what has been clarified by the court was inserted into the constitution by the 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act in 1976 under the leadership of Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. So, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi did not want to leave this particular matter to the interpretation by the courts as to whether the aid and advice which is given by the Council of Ministers is binding upon the president. She wanted to put that in the constitution. She explicitly amended the constitution. And it said that the president shall act in accordance with the aid and advice of the Council of Ministers. Now, before this, the word shall was not in the constitution and subsequently it was added. Now, it is a well understood and a well settled principle that the president has to act in accordance with the aid and advice of the Council of Ministers. There is no other way that the president can do. Of course, yes, there are certain situational discretions for the president, which we have already discussed. But apart from the situational discretion, the president has to act in accordance with the aid and advice of the Council of Ministers. 
so there is no more lack of clarity on this particular issue this is a well settled matter under our constitutional system so under the 42nd constitutional amendment act in 1976 the president has to act in accordance with aid and advice of the council of ministers but however on top of this again the constitution was amended by the 44th constitutional amendment act in 1978 wherein the janata party under the leadership of moraji desai they amended the constitution and they said Although the president is to act in accordance with the aid and advice of the Council of Ministers, but under the 44th Constitutional Amendment Act, the president can send it for the reconsideration once. Whatever is a proposal that is advised by the Council of Ministers, the president has the power to send it once for a reconsideration. So, he will send it once for reconsideration, but if the advice is again sent back, then this advice is binding upon the president. Okay, so that is a change that was made by the 44th Constitutional Amendment Act in 1978. And further, if you look into the Constitution, the President needs to be administered an oath before he assumes the office, and this oath will be administered by the Chief Justice of India. And before assuming the office, it is mandatory for him to be administered the oath. So, here if you see, uh, we are talking about the oath of the Council of Ministers. So, just ignore the statement, the previous statement that I said. So, we are talking about the oath of the Council of Ministers. So, when you talk of the oath of the Council of Ministers, the oath is to be administered by the President. The President will administer the oath. So, I was under the impression that you are discussing about the President. So, it is the uh, Council of Ministers. The oath will be administered by the President. And who will determine their salary? Their salary will be determined by the law that is made by the Parliament. The Parliament will make a law and accordingly their allowances, their salaries will be determined. And under the Constitution of India, you can understand that there is a collective responsibility and also individual responsibility to the ministers. So, what is a collective responsibility? So, collectively the ministers are responsible. Under Article 75, they are collectively responsible to the Lok Sabha. So, collectively whatever decisions that they make or whatever is the actions and omissions, the act of omissions and the commission of the government, it is not a single minister will be responsible for that. The entire government will be responsible. Because whatever may be the action of a particular ministry or a department, but because of such an action, if a no conference motion is brought in and if the government is not able to prove the majority, the entire council of ministers have to resign. So, that is why it is said that under the constitutional system, the ministers sink or they swim together. So, that is basically the idea of collective responsibility. And there can also be individual responsibility for the non performance of a particular minister. If the prime minister himself is not happy, or a corrupt activity of a particular minister, if the Prime Minister is not happy, then the Prime Minister can ask him to resign. And if he refuses to resign, then the Prime Minister can advise the President to dismiss him. So, this can be done for the individual actions. But otherwise, whatever is the collective act decisions which is taken by the government, even though implemented by a particular ministry, so you will have to understand that there is an idea of what is called as collective responsibility. And if you look into the composition of the Council of Ministers, you will understand that basically the council of ministers in our country are classified into three categories of ministers. This is something that I have already explained. So, the most important among them is the cabinet ministers. It is the cabinet ministers who are the most important among them. And then on top of the cabinet ministers, apart from the cabinet ministers, you have something which is called as, after the cabinet ministers, you have the uh, minister of state, MOS, and then the last one is the deputy ministers. Although this classification is not given in the constitution, so this is the classification that is followed by the government. So, the most important ministers, so out of the overall 70 to 80 council of ministers, around 15 to 20 ministers will be cabinet ministers. Today, you can see Mr. Rajnath Singh, Mr. Amit Shah, Mrs. Nirmala Sita Raman. So, they are all what? They are all cabinet rank. They can independently have the most important portfolios. And whatever is important for the government, so those portfolios are given to them. It is decided based on their experience, based on their age, based on their contribution to the party, based on their personal abilities. So, they are given the cabinet rank. So, below that, there is a next level of leadership that is a minister of state. So, they will have independent charge. They will have independent charge of a ministry or a department, but uh, they are not given the cabinet rank. So, in the future, they will get to the cabinet rank. And then these are deputy ministers. These deputy ministers will either help the minister of state or they will help the cabinet ministers in performing their duties and responsibilities, but definitely they are not given the cabinet rank. 
or they are not given any independent portfolio. They are not responsible for any ministry or department. They work under a cabinet minister or to a minister of state. So, this is the classification we have. And then there is also a concept of what is called as kitchen cabinet or inner cabinet. So, in fact, the cabinet is the most important ministers, but within the cabinet, let us assume within the 15 20 ministers who are given the cabinet rank, there can be two to three most important persons whom the prime minister really trusts, whom the prime minister will discuss each and every matter before taking a decision because he is a very close person in the party to the prime minister, let us assume. So, that is basically what is called as a kitchen cabinet. Say, for example, today if you take Mr. Narendra Modi, so probably his kitchen cabinet is much, much smaller. Probably he will discuss, let us assume, with Amit Shah. So, Mr. Amit Shah is part of his kitchen cabinet. And similarly, Indira Gandhi had her own cab kitchen cabinet. Prime Minister Manmohan Singh had his own kitchen cabinet. That means these are the most important ministers, which may not even include all the cabinet ministers. That is basically what is called as a kitchen cabinet. That means the basic idea is all the decisions are cooked by this kitchen cabinet members and it is placed in front of the other ministers merely for the approval but otherwise the decision is already taken so that is the idea of what is called as the kitchen cabinet so try to have an understanding but there is no formal recognition under the constitution for what is called as a kitchen cabinet or for that matter the cabinet and all those things it is only a con constitutional convention that we follow in our country in fact the only article in which this word cabinet is mentioned is article 352 so, you can just go to our emergency topic, national emergency, and you can understand in which context this particular word has been utilized. All right. So, now let us come to the last part of our discussion that is cabinet committees. So, I said that the council of ministers are divided into three types. The most important ministers are called as the cabinet ministers, and the next level of ministers are called as the minister of state, and the last one is what is called as the deputy ministers. So, whatever is the decision that is taken by the government, so the proposal will be placed in front of whom? The cabinet ministers. It is the cabinet ministers who will make the most important decisions and policies of the government. Then, then the government will act on such a decision. But in fact, for the most important decisions, not all the cabinet ministers will be called upon. So, only the relevant ministers, cabinet ministers will be called upon. Accordingly, if you see, there are a number of cabinet committees in our country. So, whenever a proposal is there, only the relevant ministers, the cabinet ministers will be called upon. Sometimes few experts apart from the cabinet ministers may also be called upon and then the decisions will be made. Suppose let us assume that there is a cabinet committee on security. Suppose let us assume that India wanted to build roads and develop infrastructure to ensure the security of our country. So, probably the ministers who will be called upon is the prime minister is the chairperson of all these cabinet committees. The Prime Minister can call upon the Home Minister, it is related to the security. The Prime Minister may call upon the Defence Minister. The Prime Minister may call upon the External Affairs Minister. The Prime Minister may call upon the Defence Minister. And apart from that, if the Prime Minister feels any of the other minister is important, another two, three ministers and some experts may be called upon. Not necessarily all the Cabinet Ministers will be called upon. So, this is to make sure that the decision is made faster and collectively by a small group of Cabinet Ministers. So, accordingly, please understand, today under the uh, system of governance in our country, there are different cabinet committees, but there is no mention of cabinet committees under the constitution. It is only according to the rules of governance and according to the conventions, these cabinet committees are followed in our country. So, what are the different cabinet committees? Cabinet committee on political affairs. This is the most important of all the cabinet committees most important of all the cabinet committees and all the cabinet committees are headed by the prime minister himself. So, what is this cabinet committee on political affairs? It makes important decisions with regard to the important policies of the government. So, all the decisions are taken by this and cabinet committee on economic affairs, all the major economic decisions are taken by the cabinet committee on economic affairs, appointments committee of the cabinet, important appointments to the government. So, appointment to secretary of various department, appointment of chairman of various PSUs. So, all these decisions are made by the appointments committee of the cabinet. Cabinet committee on parliamentary affairs. So, they will determine as to what is the agenda of the government in the parliament under this particular committee. Cabinet committee on security. This deals with defense and other important matters of the government. 
cabinet committee on accommodation so this cabinet committee on accommodation is related to allocation of uh, various houses and other infrastructure to the various uh, people within the government the higher officials cabinet committee on investment and growth a recently formed uh, uh, committee so which is majorly related to foreign direct investment and the industrial policy and all those things will be dealt under this particular committee cabinet committee on employment and skill development how to increase the employment and the skill development in our country will be decided by this particular committee so majorly the decisions are taken by the not by every minister but only by those ministers related to this particular portfolio and the prime minister can call upon the relevant ministers decide and then they start implementing this so this is basically what is called as the cabinet system all right so whatever topic that you have studied today is very very important for your prelims be it the prime minister the council of ministers or the cabinet committees you may expect one question in your prelims examination this topic may not be very relevant for your mains but of course yes, it is got huge or high relevance for your prelims examination all right so now it is time to test your understanding so come to this particular question Consider the following statement as per the Constitution of India. The President appoints the Prime Minister of India. So, see whether this particular statement is true or not. Who appoints the Prime Minister? Two, Council of Ministers apart from the Prime Minister is appointed by the Prime Minister. So, the Prime Minister is appointed by the President. That's the first statement. The other ministers are appointed by the Prime Minister. So, which of the statements given above is are incorrect? So, you'll have to identify the incorrect statement. So, you can put your answers in the comment box. All right. So, with this, we'll end the session for today. And if you want the PPT of this particular lecture, you can get it from my Telegram channel. And apart from that, as I already said, that students who are preparing for 2024 examination, a new initiative has been started with regard to how to deal with the case studies, how to analyze and how to apply your mind and how to solve the case studies. And that uh, series is going on it and the video is put on the Study IQ English channel two days in a week that is on Wednesday and also on Saturday. So, you can watch those videos also and it can immensely benefit you for your preparation. So, thank you very much for watching this particular video and if you like this video, you can share it with your friends as well. Thank you very much. All the very best. God bless.